Hey girls and boys, I'm Abby Brown. Join Iowa PBS and the Blank Park Zoo as we go wild in our examination of animals big and small. From butterflies in our gardens to coral in our oceans, animals, their habitats, and their behaviors are an important area of science exploration. Learn what it takes to care for, train, and protect all kinds of fascinating creatures. It's a zoo adventure you can take part in right from your own home. Reasons are one really important thing with these corals is we have to. And we do with our seals and sea lions. We're going to learn a little bit more about today. So today's science adventure may have you thinking we need some scuba diving gear. But our friends here at the Blank Park Zoo assure me that we do not. Let's dive in and get a peek at ocean life right here in Iowa. Hi, my name is Anne and I'm from the Blank Park Zoo. Did you know that coral reefs are found in oceans all across the world? Thousands of animals make the reef their home. And healthy reefs are really important for the health of the animals all across the ocean and also people that live all over the world. Right off the coast of Florida is one of the largest reef tracks in North America called the Florida Reef Track. And right now the Florida Reef Track is endangered and those animals need help. And Blank Park Zoo is really proud to be a part of that solution. And with me today is my friend Dana. Dana takes care of all the fish at the Blank Park Zoo, and she's here to tell us a little bit about the project. Hi guys, uh, so we are one of 15 um, AZA facilities that are taking care of corals from the Florida Reef Track, as Ann said. These corals could potentially be affected by a stony coral tissue loss disease, and it's very detrimental or really bad for these corals. So what we do is we're holding these corals for several years until uh, researchers can figure out what the issue is and hopefully return them back to the wild. So Dana, Des Moines is really far from the ocean. So how are we taking care of these animals being so far away? Yeah, um, so we took a couple months to set up four aquariums um, or trays for the corals to live in um, for this three year period. Um, and we make sure that their water quality is clean and um, healthy for them. So we have lots of filtration to help keep that clean. Uh, we do a lot of maintenance and the biggest thing is feeding them and making sure that they're well fed. Do you think you can show us? Yeah, I can take you right back. Wow, this is a new place that I've never seen before. Yeah, so this is our holding area for the corals. It's completely separate from all the other exhibits that we have at the zoo. Um, one of the main reasons or one really important thing with these corals is we have to keep them separate so they don't mix any water with any other aquariums. So are all of these different species that you have here? So we have about 10 different species here. Um, the program is working with about 26 different species of coral. So we've got um, just under half of those. Um, but it's really interesting, they all, um, even the same species can look very different. Uh, you can have one species that's a bright purple and the same exact species sometimes looks orange. So it's really, really neat how different these corals really are. So I noticed that they're on, it looks like boards and they have tags by them. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so each coral has an identification so we can tell them all apart. Um, Florida Fish and Wildlife also has that with um, linked to their genetics so they know exactly the the species of coral. Um, the numbers, uh, the first name is actually the location that the coral was collected um, in Florida. The middle part is their species um, genus and species name. And then the last number is that number of coral that it was collected. So they have anywhere from one to a hundred corals uh, of that species. So a lot of people don't realize that corals are actually animals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's really, really interesting. Um, so. Basically how corals work, they, there's a couple different things that come into play. Um, part of their um, need or for energy is lighting. So you can see that we have lights here. Um, they need the sunlight to help them grow. They also have a calcium carbonate skeleton, just like we have bones. 
Um, it's very similar for them. So they pull the calcium out of the water so that they can grow these big um, calcium structures. And they actually also have mouths. Um, each coral um, has several different polyps. You can see this one right here has, it's got about 15 polyps. It's these round, um, the circular parts. And in the very middle of that is what we call a mouth. What the coral will do is any plankton or any food item that floats by them, they actually use uh, nemocytes, which is kind of a sticky kind of way of grabbing that food and taking it in and digesting it. So they actually really are animals and they're not plants, as some people like to, um, that some people believe. So. so what would a coral eat? We feed them crushed plankton. Um, they'll eat really anything that kind of floats by them, but usually it's very small food items. So plankton is the most common food item that they would, they would take in. So as I mentioned here, we feed them uh, crushed plankton. Um, we mix it with a couple amino acids, um, really important building block for the corals to continue to grow. And it's really simple. We just mix a little tank water in there as well. We have our turkey baster and we'll suck up a little bit of food, just like that. And I'll actually directly deposit the food right onto the coral mouth. And do you have to feed each individual polyp? So we kind of space them out. These ones, since it's really easy to see all of the mouths, we try to hit all the mouths that we can. Some of them, the mouths are a little harder to distinguish, so we kind of just broadcast over the whole coral. But this one's really fun to watch eat, so I'm gonna give them lots of food. So it looks like this one, their polyps are kind of closing. Is that them actually eating? Yep. So yeah, you can see how it's the mouth is deepening and they're actually absorbing all that food and they'll take it in and use it for energy. And so we'll do that with each coral. Um, just kind of spread the food right over those mouths and let the corals do the rest. If you peek outside right now, do you see any flowers or plants? Do you notice any bees or birds or butterflies? We can spot most of them in the spring, summer, and even fall here in Iowa. And my friend Chris from the Blank Park Zoo is going to show us how we might be able to attract these animals to benefit their habitats and life cycles. I'm Chris from the Blank Park Zoo. Thanks for coming and joining us today. I would like to talk to you today about our Plant Grow Fly program. With our Plant Grow Fly program, we like to focus on our monarchs, and monarchs are a really important butterfly to Iowa. So they'll be starting to come up from the south and as they're coming up, they're gonna be looking for a specific uh, milkweed. And milkweed is a uh, flower that they, plant, they will put their eggs on. And it's, that's called a host plant for their eggs. And as the eggs, um, when, they, when they hatch, the caterpillars will eat on the milkweed and then they'll become beautiful monarch butterflies. And I'll give you a sample of what you might see as a monarch butterfly flying around. So we have a male and a female, and the males have the little dots right there on their, um, on their wings, so that's how you can tell them apart. Plus they're a little bit more showy and a little more, more colorful. So that's how you can tell a male from a female. So to, also today what I'm gonna to show you is, is how to make a seed bomb. And this is something that you can do at home pretty easily. It doesn't take a whole lot of supplies. You can get some clay, so you can get that from, um, if you have clay in your backyard or in your yard, you can use that, or you can go to the, uh, the store and get some clay. All this is natural stuff that'll go right back into the earth and it'll break down and um, hopefully your, the flowers will, will bloom.
you're gonna flatten it in the middle. So you're gonna make like maybe like a bird's nest is kind of how I look at it. So you take your thumb and you make a nice big hole inside your clay there. So everybody see that? Then what you're gonna do is put a little uh, potting soil in there, or a little dirt too. You can get that from your yard or your, your potting soil from your flowers that you planted around your house. And then you're gonna put your seeds. So we have some milkweed seed here. Um, and we have some other flowers in here like aster and coneflower. And all these will be nice showy plants and they'll be great nectar sources. So we're gonna put those right inside the little ball here. And then we're gonna close it up real, real tight. Roll it tight up in your hands. So you make like a donut hole. Get it nice and tight in there. Then you're gonna let it dry. And you're gonna let it dry. Usually like, I like to put mine in my windowsill and let them dry there. And then when they're all dried, I'll take my seed balls and then I'll throw them out into my garden, which is a lot of fun to do. Or maybe I might find a greater ditch and uh, throw them out into the greater ditch to get some more of uh, the milkweed out there or other uh, pollinating flowers out there for our butterflies. So some of the things to think about when you're, when you're making a garden for butterflies and for other pollinators, you wanna make sure that you have host plants. So host plants are important because that's what the butterfly is gonna lay their egg on. It's very, so to have more butterflies and more caterpillars, you need host plants. So some really good, besides milkweed, some other good host plants are dill. I love the dill, it helps our, um, with our swallowtails. Uh, another one would be purple uh, uh, prairie coneflower or clover. Those are also really good host plants. The other thing you need is uh, to have nectar. So nectar, host, nectar plants are gonna be the ones that have the sweetness to them. So they're gonna give our butterflies and our hummingbirds something that they can eat on and then they can help pollinate other, uh, pl other plants as they go. Cosmos are really good and pretty easy. And zinnias, I love the zinnias. They're really showy and really, really bright. And you can plant new ones every single year. So they're annuals, because you can plant new ones every year. So that's something I really like to do. When also when you're looking at your butterfly gardens area, you wanna make sure that you have sunlight so that the plants can grow. And you wanna make sure you have water. So that's important for the, for the plants, but also for the butterflies, because they need water. And so do our hummingbirds. And then you wanna make sure that you have areas where they can sun on themselves. So some rocks are really nice, so they can feel that sun, they can get warm, and kind of in, also enjoy the garden that you made for them when they're out there. So again, we have our seed balls that you'll make, and you wanna plant uh, flowers for our monarchs and for other butterflies that you're gonna find here in Iowa. And we're really excited to have you part of the Blank Park Zoo Plant Grow Fly program. For more information, you can always go to the Plant Grow Fly website on the zoo's website to find out what do I need for my garden? How do I plant my garden? Where do I find all these awesome plants that you're talking about? Then the next thing you can do is register your garden on our website, because we want to know all about your garden. What did you name it? What are the flowers you have in there? Are you in North Central Iowa? Are you in Southern Iowa? Are you from another state? We want to know where are you planting these flowers and uh, tell us all about them. And then we'll send you a certificate to say that you're part of the garden, you're part of the Plant Grow Fly uh, program. Thank you today for coming out and making seed balls with us. And I hope you have a wonderful day. Here are a few amazing animal facts for you. Giraffe have excellent eyesight, and they can spot predators like hyenas or lions from far away. Pretty handy, right? And when rhinos feel threatened, their instinct is not to run away, but to run directly at whatever has scared them. Can you even imagine? Let's go meet these magnificent plant eaters here at the Blank Park Zoo. Hi, my name is Anne, and I'm from the Blank Park Zoo. And with me, I have my very special friends, the Eastern Black Rhinos. This is Ayana and her baby, Kamara. Did you know that Kamara just turned one in this past April? These guys are called Eastern Black Rhinos because they roll in 
dark soil and dark mud that gives them kind of that black look. It, has, it doesn't have anything to do with their skin color. It has to do with the soil that they roll and they, they wallow in. And they're a little bit different than a white rhino because the soil color is a little bit different in the region where the white rhinos live. Something else that you'll really notice about them, which is cool, if you look at their top lip, if you look at Iana's top lip, it's pointed, and that's called a prehensile lip. And that lets her grab leaves and branches and fruit in the wild and eat it. And she's called a browser because she goes after those branches and those leaves. A white rhino, their top lip would be flat because they're grazers and they like to eat grass. So that's one of the ways that you can tell the difference between a white rhino and a black rhino. Other cool things about them, look at their size. Ayana is about 2,500 pounds. That is the size of a car. And her baby, her baby right now at one year old is just under 1,000 pounds. And at birth, she weighed 100 pounds, which is the size of an elementary student. Look at her horns. See how they're nice and big? Those horns are made of keratin, and it's a fibrous material, and it helps protect them. So when a rhino gets startled in the wild, the first thing they'll do is they charge, and then they'll investigate later. So that's how they get their reputation. They're actually quite docile animals by nature, but, when, but just don't startle them, because that's when they will start to charge. The other cool thing you can notice about is their ears. See how their ears are moving back and forth? That's listening for any kind of danger or predators. So their ears will rotate all around, just like satellite dishes, catching up sound all around them to see what's going on. And the mom, Ayana, she's very aware of everything going on so that she can protect her baby, Kamara. Look at their feet. You see how they have, looks like almost toes on their feet? And when they walk, those toes, the, the pads flatten out in the ground, and that helps them from sinking into the ground when they are walking. And of course, they have little tails too. And if you look at their tails, just like on a horse, they'll use their tail to swat away bugs and flies. Did you know that rhinos are very intelligent animals? And at the zoo, we can actually train them um, to do different behaviors to help in their animal welfare and their care. They also make little sounds. So the babies, when they're young, and if they get nervous or if they get scared, they'll make a little call calling for their mom. And then mom is on high alert, knows that they need to go over and protect their young. Now you might be wondering, how much does the zoo feed these animals every single day? So we feed them about 50 pounds of food a day. So if you think about that, that is like 200 cheeseburgers. So 50 pounds of food. Now of course rhinos don't eat cheeseburgers. They prefer leaves and branches and we feed them special pellets made just for rhinos and then lots of vegetables um, and, and hay or different kinds of grasses. Something else that's really cool about them is they can live to be between 45 and 50 years old. So Ayana right here, the mom, she's only gonna be 10 this year. So she hopefully has a long life ahead of her and the little baby just turned one. They have a long time to live with us and be with us at the zoo. Rhinos in the wild are endangered. They're being hunted over and over again for their horns. The horns really do not have a lot of value. Some people think they uh, can be used for medicine. Some people like to make um, like handles for um, daggers out of them as a, as a sign of wealth. But really, they, do not, they don't have any medicinal value to them at all. And we wanna make sure that these rhinos are protected. So at Blank Park Zoo, we work with the International Rhino Foundation, and we help protect those animals in the wild so they can build up their populations. And right now, our baby rhino, every rhino counts because a baby is only born every two to three years. So the mom could be pregnant for 15 months, which is over a year. So they do not have babies very often. So that's why we have to really protect them. And uh, the Blank Park Zoo helps by doing that by having these guys over here. My friend Shannon behind me is feeding Jacoby. Jacoby is a male giraffe, and you can tell that he's a male because he has the bump 
bumps on his head that makes him really handsome to other giraffe. Giraffe are the largest mammals in the world. They can grow to be between 17 and 20 feet tall. Did you know that mammals all have fur and giraffe have fur just like every other mammal, but it's really short um, because they live in Africa where it's warmer out. The other thing that all mammals have is they all have seven neck bones. You have seven neck bones too, and so do giraffe. But look at the giraffe's neck. They're so much longer than ours, and their bones are just much bigger than our bones, but we both have the same number. The other thing that's really neat is look at that long neck. That long neck can grow six feet long. That is the size of a, an adult human. Shannon's feeding Jacoby right there, and as she feeds him, look at his really long tongue. His tongue is a dark purple or a black color, and it can be 18 inches long. Giraffes spend about 75% of their day eating leaves in the wild. So almost the entire day, they eat leaves, and they only rest a little bit. So they can stretch way up in the trees, and they'll wrap that tongue around a branch and pull all the leaves off of it, and that's how they eat. Giraffe have unique patterns. No two giraffe is the same. So if you look at their patterns on the side of their body, that's how you can tell them apart, just like your own fingerprints that you have as unique to you. If you look at Jacoby's head, he has ossicones. Those are those big horns that stick up from his head. Every giraffe, both boys and girls, males and females, have those ossicones, and that's to serve as protection for them, especially when they're um, browsing in the trees for those leaves. Those ossicones help protect their heads. You can also notice his ears. Look at those ears. Giraffe are herbivores, and they're prey species, so predators will try and catch them. And so they are always on the lookout for predators, and so those ears rotate around just like those big satellite dishes, um, listening for any danger that could be nearby. And when they hear danger, they will start running, and they can run really fast for short distances. How many hours a day do you sleep at night? Giraffe really don't sleep very much at all. In fact, they will sleep for very, very, very short times, um, just a few minutes at a time standing up. Once in a while, you'll see a giraffe can sit down, but their head is always upright with their long neck, and it's very difficult for them to stand back up again. That's why most of the time, giraffe will always stay standing, and you'll always see them um, sleeping when they're standing up. Do you have a dog at home, or hamster, a cat, or maybe a parakeet? Some of the pets that we live with are highly trainable, and some just do their own thing. But at the zoo, there's one group of party animals that love to be trained for the spotlight, sea lions. Thank you, Abby. My name is Shannon McKenney, and I'm here at Blank Park Zoo in our hub harbor with Zoe and Addie, our two beautiful sea lions. We are joining a training demonstration right now. As you can see, Zoe and Addie are working with their trainers behind me on a variety of different behaviors. Here at Blank Park Zoo, we use something called operant conditioning or positive reinforcement training, also known as clicker training. You may even hear the clickers behind me. The clicker is what's known as a bridge. And what it means is that the behavior we've just asked, the animal did beautifully, they hear that click to know it's exactly what we wanted, and then they get a delicious yummy treat. In this case, it's fish, which is their favorite. A lot of the behaviors that we do with the sea lions are to help with their health care or husbandry training. So things like drawing blood, ultrasounds and x-rays, and even just a checkup, so lifting their flippers or opening the mouth, just like you would do if you went to the doctor or the dentist. We also do a lot of fun behaviors that show off their athleticism. Sea lions are amazing athletes. They have high speed and great jumps. Zoe and Addie are eight and nine years old, and they came to us from the wild. Our two lovely ladies were stranded as pups and unfortunately could not survive on their own in the wild. So that's when they moved to Blank Park Zoo and became a part of Blank Park Zoo's family. 
these two girls are wild and full of spirit. They love to learn and they love to show off. When you visit Blank Park Zoo, you can see these two girls showing off to the public with their fun, exciting, and adventurous behaviors. You'll see big jumps and high speeds on these ladies. They are so much fun to work with, but you have to be two steps ahead because they're always thinking of fun ways to mess with us. Thank you so much for joining me and Zoe and Addie. Now we're gonna go over to the giraffe and see how we use the same training with these guys that we can do with our giraffe friends. Come join me. Now before we get started, I just wanna mention a few things. You will see myself and our trainers wearing masks, and that's because we're trying to protect and keep the animals safe. So don't worry, we just wanna make sure all of our animals are safe while we're working in close contact with them. So now we'll get over to the training. This is husbandry training. So what that means is we train behaviors that allow us to take better care of our giraffe and allow them to participate in their own health care. So some of the behaviors you'll see are we might look at their hooves or their tongue. We can target them. That's what that little ball on a stick is. And when we target them, that allows us to hold their focus and get them close to us. So if we need to train a new behavior or a different behavior, we can use that. So you'll see our keepers giving out nice yummy treats. Our giraffe love apples and sweet potatoes and carrots as their fun yummy treats. Some of the different behaviors that we do allow us to do more detailed health care. So we can draw blood from our giraffe. We even x-ray their hooves. Did you know that giraffe get pedicures? Ours do. We have a farrier who is someone who focuses just on hooves come in and file our giraffe hooves down to keep them healthy and to help them with their walking. Let's see if we can see some of the fun behaviors right here with Skye. Skye is uh, one of our younger giraffe. She is six years old. And you can see the trainer is working with her to back up. And the tongue, look at that big long tongue. We can also do a side present, so if we need to get to just the side of Skye, we can do that. And so we can get a nice look at her whole body. Well, thank you so much for joining us at the giraffe training session. Thank you for going wild with Iowa PBS and the Blank Park Zoo. I'm Abby Brown. And as always, remember to ask questions and wonder. That's what science is all about.